Welcome back to 60 Plus, a series where I take a deeper look at games that I've continued playing beyond one hour. After the introduction of the new generation of consoles this month, there's been an absolute flood of games to play. The first one that I stuck with to the end has been Spider-Man Miles Morales. Now, Spider-Man has never been one of my favorite superheroes, and open world games rarely grab my attention long enough to finish them. So why did I finish Miles Morales, and how, at the end of my journey, did I end up so emotionally invested? For starters, in case it isn't clear out of the gate, the production value of this game is off the charts. New York City is gorgeously recreated, and whether it's lit by the sun just off the horizon, or it's simply a snowy day, it can truly be breathtaking. It's hard to put the game's visuals in a bad light, and is abundantly clear the amount of love that was put into the game. Certain scenes dropped my jaw with the amount of technology going into them to make them look as amazing as they do. This was the first game that I've played that featured ray-traced reflections, and it was really impressive to see. But something happened once I started zipping around to the skyline, and that was that I realized that I was moving too quickly to truly appreciate those additional details. In my opinion, the movement in this game is better served by a higher frame rate than it is with the heightened visual flourishes, which is why the majority of the footage in this video will be from the performance mode instead. But it still looks stunning, let's not kid ourselves. The audio is equally impressive too. Constantly throughout the game, Miles is on the phone with other people as he goes leaping from building to building. In an absolute stroke of genius, each of those dialogue lines have actually been recorded twice. Once for when Miles is swinging through the air or running down the street, and another for when things are calm and he's not out of breath. It's subtle, but it adds well to the immersion. The second sound feature that particularly stuck out to me was that due to the freeform nature of the game, phone calls can be interrupted at any time. Yet once the interruption is finished, the phone call naturally resumes right where it left off. The way the game does this is more than just starting and stopping the same audio file though. It's done in a way to not break the flow of the game or the immersion by using bespoke pieces of dialogue to get right back to where the conversation left off. This kind of audio doesn't really showcase well in a video, but the amount of work that goes into features like these, features deliberately designed to be invisible, is astounding. I don't mean to imply that the game is without its faults though. In fact, I have a plethora of nitpicks that I could make about the game, ranging from gameplay systems to bugs that I encountered. Like how button prompts are inconsistent in their usage, where sometimes L2 and R2 are required to go through grates, but other times it's triangle or how at certain locations you must pull some gears before webbing them in place. And it's hit or miss whether the camera will stay locked onto the gear, or whether it will reset to a default position. I think collectively though, my main complaints come down to polish. At this point, the game has become notorious for its various glitches and crashes, so it's no surprise that there would be some polish related issues. I didn't experience getting turned into an inanimate object, like many of the videos being posted online, but I did get pushed into the wrong side of level geometry, repeatedly had multiple conversations overlapping with each other, and even had a cutscene where only Miles' dialogue stopped playing halfway through. None of these issues were enough to keep me from enjoying my time. However, collectively, it's impossible to say that they didn't in some way detract from it either. I think another way to put it is that this is a game that excels super well at the broad strokes, and even in some specific areas of detail. It nails the top 1% of details, as well as the bottom 90%. But that specific zone in between is where the game starts to falter. A perfect example of this is the way the movement system works. Once I learned all of the advanced techniques, like web zipping and point launching, my experience became transformative. It was amazing jumping from building to building, grabbing massive air, dive bombing the street, only to catch myself at the last minute to slingshot further and faster. The way that custom animations play when engaging with specific elements was a great touch and really heightened the experience. When on the ground and you're fighting enemies, it's easy to chain together combos, jumping from one enemy to the next, doling out massive amounts of damage, and looking cool while doing it is streamlined and difficult to not get some impressive looking maneuvers. The reason both swinging rooftop to rooftop and fighting enemies can feel so good is because the game not only looks at the raw controller inputs to determine what moves should be performed, but also by assuming intent. It intelligently tries to figure out what it thinks you actually want it to do, in an attempt to increase fluidity and promote the feeling of really being a superhero. It doesn't always get it right, and when it doesn't, it can be really annoying, but the amount of times that it does versus doesn't is commendable and unmistakable. However, there exists this space, maybe 20 to 30 feet off the ground, where the controls show their limitations. 
it's the transition zone, when you're not fighting enemies and you're not in a full swing yet. The game frequently fails to make the correct assumption in regards to intent, and movement becomes stiff and awkward. Sometimes it will adhere you to a wall, and other times it won't. Sometimes it will lock to an edge, and it's easy to walk back and forth from a safe perch. Other times it will remove you from safety, presuming you wanted to jump. This failure in assumption led to some truly frustrating stealth encounters. Besides gameplay, the story and characters are the other main hook here. I don't want to get into too many story details, because the overall game isn't particularly long, and spoiling any of it would be significant. I will say though, it was a real joy to see how nearly everything gets set up and paid off. There's no wasted time in terms of narrative, and anybody who knows this channel knows how much I appreciate when time is used properly. Overall, it's not the most unpredictable story, yet the performances and characters themselves are written to a point that I was emotionally impacted by the ending and took away some real life truths from Peter Parker himself. I've not seen any other game assume intent as much as this one does, and it's one of the main reasons why I believe it can feel so incredible to play. Open world games typically need to have an interesting movement mechanic for me to stick with them. And this one has that. Add on a story with some really compelling characters, dress it up with some remarkable visuals, and above all, don't drag out the experience with unnecessary padding, and you have a winner. It's not my favorite game ever, it has too many rough edges for that to be the case, but the journey was undoubtedly one that I was glad to have experienced. It had even stretched to call it amazing. Spider-Man. You know what to do, 